Hello, thank you for joining me today. I'm Linda Lamp here. And as you know, we've been reading A Course in Miracles, the main text. And today we'll be reading from chapter 23, The War Against Yourself, section three, The Laws of Chaos. This is a rather long section in and of itself. So that's all we'll read today. Before I get started though, I wanted to talk about something that has come up um, in some of the other uh, circles and uh, uh, live streams that I've been holding. There is a teaching within the law, of, within the Course in Miracles, that we create our own reality. We're creating our reality. And that when things happen to us, that we've played a role in making those things happen. The subject came up specifically in relationship to abuse the other day, that when you are in a, an abused relationship, the teaching that many teachers in the Course of Miracles will tell you that you played a hand in that. You played a hand in bringing that abuse about. And uh, quite frankly, I, I, I'm gonna tell you this story because I think it's really important to understand when this person brought that forward in the live stream that I was doing, I suggested they burn the book. I didn't know what book it was. They had not given me the title. I've only since been informed that the title of the book they were talking about was this book we're reading, A Course in Miracles. So I wanna clarify something here. We talk about it early on but you may, you may not remember, or you, I may not have gone into it in, in the same depth that I'm going to go into it today. This is a channeled work. A Course in Miracles came through a woman by the name of Helen as a channeled piece. The thing that you must remember about channeled works is that they're coming through a channel. It's just like water through a hose. If you have a brand new hose and you attach it to the flow of water that is crystal pure, what comes out the other end will be crystal pure water that's been through a brand new hose. So in and of itself, it has changed. Now, if that hose has any kind of debris in it, let's say it's not a brand new hose. Let's say it's an old hose. Let's say it was a hose that got used to pump out a diesel tank. Well, now when you run that beautiful, clean, crystal clear water through this hose that was previously used to pump out a diesel tank, what are you going to get at the other end? you're not going to get crystalline pure water. Now, I'm not suggesting that the channel was uh, defective. I am, what I'm suggesting is, is that there's absolutely no way that anything coming through a channel is not at risk, at a minimum, of being influenced by the channel. And I dare say that there are many things in this uh, book that do not match other teachings of spirituality. They don't match other wisdom that exists. And the key, the most important piece of it for me, because I'm the one in, in this instance, and it will be for you in your case. For me personally, there is much wisdom missing from this book. And there is much wisdom that is confused in the words of this book. That's how I believe this book exists, right? It exists, but for me, it is not like a Bible. It is not 
and any I shouldn't have said that word because that in and of itself isn't a pure book either. That book is lots of people's ideas about things. So if you if you follow my teachings and you're a, you're familiar with my work, what I always tell people is you need to go within and find your wisdom. Find what is true for you inside of you. That is where the answers about your life lie. They don't lie out in the world. They don't lie in this book or any other book without having been run through your own filter. Please don't read some book and then just start acting the way the book suggests or doing the things that the book suggests without first taking it within and measuring it against what feels true for you. Because you have all the wisdom in the universe available to you from within you. All of this that I'm doing, this book, the reading, this is all out here in the world to help you find the truth within you. And I can tell you 100% assuredness that abuse does not come upon us because we brought it to us. There's a much bigger dynamic going on. That doesn't mean there isn't some element of that within it, but that is not the reason that it exists. And if you are in an abusive relationship or if you are being abused, there is absolutely no reason that you should be thinking this is your fault and that you brought it on yourself and that some change within yourself will make the abuse stop. Because that concept is missing some other really important teachings. The main one being when a person does or says anything, it's about them. Not the person they're saying it to or about or doing it to. It's about the person doing the doing. So if if you're struggling with this, if you're if you've someone that's been abused or you know somebody who's being abused and you're trying to marry the teachings from within the Course in Miracles with the abuse and you somehow think that that the person's brought it to themselves or created it or that this is what God wants, you know, please reach out to me. You can text me 907-351-3003. Call me if you don't get me, leave me a voicemail. I'll help you work through this um, because this is really uh, some, there's some really twisted metaphysical spiritual teachings out there that are just confusing our ability to heal. They're delaying it and they're confusing it. In a, I read for uh, Humanities Teams Conversations with God Book Club, and today we're reading. Uh, Neil Donald Walsh's The God Solution. And in it, he was talking about the spiritual concept, the teaching that you, you, created your, you create your reality. You create your reality from within. It's your response to what happens to you that makes your reality. You don't create the reality of somebody abusing you. That is not what's happening. So please, let's, let's put an end to that confusion in these lessons. And if you need any kind of help, message me, text me, go to my website, lindalamp.shop, and um, send me a message from there. Send me an email to questions at walkingthroughyourwalls.com. Uh, or again, 907 351 3003. All right, let's get started with the reading. I apologize for the delay. A Course in Miracles, this is chapter 23, The War Against Yourself. And this is section three, The Laws of Chaos. The laws of chaos can be brought to light. 
though never understood. Chaotic laws are hardly meaningful and therefore out of reason's sphere, yet they appear to be an obstacle to reason and to truth. Let us then look upon them calmly, that we may look beyond them, understanding that they are not what they would maintain. It is essential it be understood what they are, because it is their purpose to make meaningless and to attack the truth. Here are the laws that rule the world you made, and yet, given they govern nothing and need not be broken, merely looked upon and gone beyond. The first chaotic law is that the truth is different for everyone. Like all these principles, this one maintains that each is separate and has a different set of laws, that, a set of thoughts that set him off from others. This principle evolves from the belief that there is a hierarchy of illusions. Some are more valuable and, some, and therefore true. Each one establishes this for himself and makes it true by his attack on what other val another values. And this is justified because the values differ and those who hold them seem to be unlike, unalike and therefore enemies. Think how this seems to interfere with the first principle of miracles. For this establishes degrees of truth among illusions, making it seem that some of them are harder to overcome than others. If it were realized that they are all the same and equally untrue, it would be easy then to understand that miracles apply to all of them. Errors of any kind can be corrected because they are untrue. When brought to truth instead of to each other, they merely disappear. No part of nothing can be more resistant to truth than can another. Ugh, no part of nothing can be more resistant to the truth than can another. I don't care for the language, as you know. All right. The second law of chaos, dear indeed, to every worshiper of sin is that one must sin and therefore deserves attack and death. This principle, closely related to the first, is the demand that errors call for punishment and not correction. For the destruction of one who makes the error places him beyond correction and beyond forgiveness. What he has done is thus interpreted as an irreconcilable, no, as an irrevocable sentence upon himself, which God himself is powerless to overcome. Sin cannot be remitted. Among the belief of belief, the Son of God can make mistakes for which his own destruction becomes inevitable. Think that this seems to do with the relationship between the Father and the Son. Now it appears that they can never be one again, for one must always be condemned and by the other. Now they are different and enemies, and their relationship is one of opposition, just as the separate aspects of the sun meet only to conflict but not join. One becomes weak, the other strong by his defeat, and fear of God and each other now appears as sensible, made by what the Son of God has done both to himself and his creator. Arrogance, on which the laws of chaos stand, could not be more apparent than emerges here. Here is a principle that would define what the creator of reality must be, what he must think, and what he must believe, and how he must respond. Believing it, and how he must respond, believing it. It is not seen as even necessary that he be asked about the truth of what has been established for his belief. His son can tell him this, and he has but the choice whether to take his word for it or be mistaken. This leads directly to the third preposterous belief that seems to make chaos eternal. For if God cannot be mistaken, he must accept his son's belief in what he is and hate him for it. See how the fear of God is reinforced by this third principle. Now it becomes impossible to turn to him for help in misery, for now he has become the enemy who caused it. 
whom appeal, to whom appeal is useless. Nor can salvation lie within the Son, whose every aspect seems to be at war with him and justified in its attack. And now its conflict made inevitable beyond the help of God, for now salvation must remain impossible because the Savior has become the enemy. Oh, hang on. There can be no release and no escape. Atonement thus becomes a myth, and vengeance, not forgiveness, is the will of God. From where all this begins, there is no sight of help that can succeed. Only destruction can be the outcome, and God himself seems to be siding with it to overcome his son. Think not the ego will enable you to find escape from what it wants. This is the function of this course, which does not value what the ego cherishes. The ego values only what it takes. This leads to the fourth law of chaos, which, if the others are accepted, must be true. This seeming law is the belief that you have, that you believe you have what you have taken. By this, another's loss becomes your gain, and thus it fails to recognize that you can never take away, save from yourself. Yet all the other laws must lead to this. For enemies do not give willingly to one another, nor would they seek to share the things they value. And what your enemies would keep from you must be worth having, because they keep it hidden from your sight. All of the mechanisms of madness are seen emerging here, the enemy made strong by keeping hidden the valuable inheritance that should be yours, your justified position and attack for what has been withheld, and the inevitable loss the enemy must suffer to save yourself. Thus do the guilty ones protest their innocence. Were they not forced into this foul attack by the unscrupulous behavior of the enemy, they would respond with only kindness. But in the savage world, the kind would not survive, and so they must take or else be taken from. This teaching, I'm sorry, is just making me crazy. And I really would like to just abandon this project and stop reading because we're so in the weeds. But I'm, I'm dedicated to continuing this project and finishing the entire reading of this book. So we will go on. I'll talk some about this at the end. And now there is a vague unanswered question yet not explained. What is this precious thing, this priceless pearl, this hidden secret treasure to be wrested in righteous wrath from the most treacherous and cunning enemy? It must be what you want but never found. And now you understand the reason why you found it not, for it was taken from you by the enemy and hidden where you would think not to look. He hid it in his body, making it the cover for his guilt, the hiding place for what belongs to you. Now must his body be destroyed and sacrificed that you may have what belongs to you. His treachery demands his death that you may live, and you attack only in self-defense. But what is this? But what is it you want that needs his death? Can you be your murderous attack? I'm sorry. Can you be sure your murderous attack is justified unless you know what it is for? And here a final principle of chaos comes into the rescue. It holds that there is a substitute for love. This is the magic that will cure all your pain, the missing factor in your madness. Is it what makes it sane? This is the reason why you must attack. Here is what makes your vengeance justified. Behold, unveiled the ego's secret gift, torn from your brother's body, hidden there in malice and in hatred for the one to whom the gift belongs. He would deprive you of the secret ingredient that would give you meaning to your life, the substitute for love born of your enmity. To your brother must be salvation. It has no substitute and there is only one. And all your relationships have but the purpose of seizing it and making it your own. Never is your possession made complete and, will, and never will your brother cease his attack on you for what you stole. 
nor will God end his vengeance upon both, for in his madness he must have this substitute for love and kill you both. You who believe you walk in sanity with feet on solid ground and through a world where meaning can be found, consider this. There are law, the laws on which your sanity appears to rest. These are the principles which make the ground beneath your feet seem solid, and it is here you look for meaning. There are laws you made for your salvation. They hold in place the substitute for heaven which you prefer. This is their purpose. They were made for this. There is no point in asking what they mean. That is apparent. The means of madness must be insane. Are you certain that you realize the goal is madness? No one wants madness, nor does anyone cling to his, this madness if he sees that this is what it is. What protects madness is the belief that it is true. It is the function of insanity to take the place of truth. It must be seen as truth to be believed. And if it is the truth, then must its opposite, which was the truth before, be madness now. Such a reversal completely turned around with madness sanity, in illusions true, attack a kindness, hatred love, and murder benediction is the goal of the laws of chaos, the, the goal the laws of chaos serve. These are the means by which the laws of God appear to be reversed. Here do the laws of sin appear to uphold, love captive, and let sin go free. These do not seem to be the goals of chaos, for by the great reversal they appear to be laws of order. How could it not be so? Chaos is lawlessness and has no laws to be believed its seeming laws must be perceived as real. Their goal of madness must be seen as sanity. And fear, with ashen lips and sightless eyes, blinded and terrible to look upon, is lifted to the throne of love, its dying conqueror, its substitute, the savior from salvation. How lovely do the laws of fear make death appear. Give thanks unto the hero, on love's throne, who saved the Son of God for fear and death. Hang on. Sorry, I had to... Just take a quick sip. Okay. And yet how can it be that laws like these can be believed? There is a strange device that makes it possible. Nor is it unfamiliar. We have seen how it appears to function many times before. In truth, it does not function. Yet in dreams, where only shadows play the major roles, it seems most powerful. No law of chaos could compel belief but for the emphasis on form and disregard of content. No one who thinks that one of these laws is true sees what it says. Some forms it takes seem to have meaning, and that is all. How can some forms of murder not mean death? Can an attack in any form be love? What form of condemnation is a blessing? Who makes his savior powerless and finds salvation? Let not the form of attack on him deceive you. You cannot seek to harm him and be saved. Who can find safety from attack by turning on himself? How can it matter that the form this madness takes I'm sorry, how, how can it matter what the form this madness takes? Is a judgment that defends itself condemning what it says it wants to save? Be not deceived when madness takes a form you think is lovely. What is intent on your destruction 
is not your friend. What is intent on your destruction is not your friend. You would maintain and think it true that you do not believe these senseless laws nor act upon them. And when you look at what they say, they cannot be believed. Brother, you do believe them. For how else could you perceive the form they take with content such as this? Can any form of this be tenable? Yet you believe them for this form they take and do not recognize the content. It never changes. Can you paint rosy lips upon a skeleton, dress it in loveliness, pet it and pamper it and make it live? And can you be content with an illusion that you are living? There is no life outside of heaven. Where God created life, there must be there life must be. In any state apart from heaven, life is illusion. At best, it seems like life, at worst, like death. Yet both are judgments on what is not life, equal in their inaccuracy and lack of meaning. Life not in heaven is impossible, and what is not in heaven is not anywhere. Outside of heaven, the only conflict of illusion stands, senseless, impossible, and beyond all reason, and yet perceived as an eternal barrier to heaven. Illusions are but forms. Their content is never true. The laws of chaos govern all illusions. Their forms conflict, making it seem quite possible to value some above other, the others. Yet each one rests as surely on the belief the laws of chaos are the laws of order, as do the others. Each one upholds these laws completely, offering a certain witness to the law to, that these laws are true. The seeming gentler forms of attack are no less certain in their witnessing or their results. Certain it is illusions will bring fear because the beliefs that they imply, not for their form. Certain it is, illusions will bring fear because of the beliefs that they imply, not for their form. And lack of faith in love in any form attests to chaos, to chaos as reality. From the belief in sin, the faith in chaos must follow. It is because it follows that it seems to be a logical conclusion, a valid step in ordered thought. The steps in to chaos do follow nearly, neatly from their starting point. Each is a different form in the progression of truth's reversal, leading deeper still into terror and away from truth. Think not one step is smaller than another, nor, nor that return from one is easier. The whole descent from heaven lies in each one, and where your thinking starts, there must it end. Brother, take not one step in the descent to hell, for having taken one, you will not recognize the rest for what they are, and they will follow. Attack in any form has placed your foot upon the twisted stairway that leads from heaven. Yet any instant it is possible to have all this undone. How can you know whether you choose the stairs to heaven or the way to hell? Quite easily, how do you feel? Is peace in your awareness? Are you certain which way you go? And are you sure the goal of heaven can be reached? If not, you walk alone. Ask then your friend to join you and give you certainty where you go. That is the end of this section. And I might sum it up in a, a completely different way with completely different language. We have all of this chaos this chapter was full of chaos, chaotic ideas. 
but we have all of it because we have forgotten who and what we are. Who and what we are, each of us, is divinity in form. Everything we see before our eyes is divinity in functionality. Everything. There isn't anything that exists that is not a part of and connected to and filled with divinity. Nothing. Nothing. And so, yes, there's a lot of chaos in this world because we're very twisted in our understandings. We're very confused. You are the divine. The divine is living in you. You are being breathed. Were it not the divine's choice for you to be in existence, your breath will stop. Your breath is not a function of your body. Your body is the balloon that is being breathed to life every moment by the divinity that exists in everything. And when you're done here, when your soul and spirit are done here, your breath will stop. Your body will cease. You will return to the whole. You do not end. Your life does not end. Yes, the life you're living in this housing, in your body, that'll end. But you don't. You won't. <clears throat> so uh, thank you for joining me today. I think that's enough. I've talked your ear off today. Uh, as I said in the beginning, if you would like support with this, if you would like support in general, I am here for you. That is my purpose. I am in service on purpose for you. So please reach out to me if you have questions, concerns, confusions about this material or anything else about life. I am here to serve. So until the next time, namaste and much love. <laughs>